This conference will now be recorded. There we go. And a copy of the slides in this recording will be posted to our website uh, later this afternoon at shpllc.com slash webinars. Uh, you'll be able to download a PDF copy of the slides as well as a YouTube recording of today's meeting. Uh, second, please remain muted during this presentation. While you can ask questions in the chat box at any time, uh, we will uh, have an opportunity for you to unmute and ask questions. Uh, and when that time comes, you can press star six on the phone, or if you have connected the app with your call-in, uh, you can click uh, the microphone icon in the app. So with all that, I'm actually gonna turn this over to Robin Garrett, uh, who's going to give a more complete introduction uh, to the Capital Strategy Group. Robin? Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we do appreciate you taking, uh, hopefully, what is your lunch hour to join us today uh, for this uh, legislative recap and debrief from our government and public affairs team at Capital Strategies Group. Um, we also want to thank them for the endless hours and all of their efforts um, to have a positive impact and help drive um, and influence policies that benefit your, your hospitals and your practices and ultimately the individuals of your services. So um, with that being said, we want to welcome Travis Lindley and Devin Kretzel and Kathleen Tehan. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today to provide this recap for our clients. Thanks, Robin, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there's a, there's mounting pressure now that I've learned all of you are uh, watching this while trying to eat lunch. So uh, we'll try and keep it somewhat entertaining. Um, two weeks ago yesterday marked the close of the uh, 2021 legislative session. And uh, like everything else in life these days, it was uh, certainly an odd, odd affair. Uh, it was the first legislative term, uh, session of the two year term. Uh, so it's it's important to note uh, and we understand you um, you should have or we can make available a, a printed uh, update uh, that has the comprehensive comprehensive legislative summary in it. Uh, there's a lot of information in it. You'll note uh, the vast majority of the legislation uh, noted in the report uh, actually holds over to uh, 2022, the the second half of the legislative session, but. Uh, we uh, reconcluded our 40-day session. Uh, in that regard, it usually wraps up the end of March, and uh, they, true to form, ended up on March 31st. Um, it at the at a very high level, uh, I would say, it was a great year for uh, for medicine, uh, for, for patients, uh, and sort of for the healthcare space. A lot of good public policy was uh, was worked on, hammered out, and uh, now awaits. Governor Kemp's uh, bill review period, which uh, runs for 40 days. It'll end roughly the uh, first full week of uh, May. Uh, no, no, uh, nothing of great controversy in the healthcare space that uh, we'll get to in a couple of moments to think that there uh, is reason for uh, concern that something may get vetoed, uh, but certainly that is uh, the governor's, uh, governor's prerogative. Uh, so we're watching that closely. Couple of a uh, couple of sort of noteworthy things about the legislative session. The, uh, of course, the with the last election, the constitutional officers were not up, uh, so they they hold over till their election in 2022. But uh, we had a, a very different uh, legislature. While the leadership in the majority party remained the same, a lot of changes in terms of uh, committee post, uh, committee assignments, and rank and file members. Of the 236 members of the General Assembly, there were roughly 40 new members, uh, and in the in the legislature world, that is a, an enormous turnover. So a lot of new folks, a lot of good uh, opportunity to ingratiate our folks with uh, with new uh, new information about the folks we represent, uh, and some good some good new folks uh, on board. Uh, this was the first session uh, ever uh, in Georgia history that we had. Uh, an even larger physician caucus. We had five uh, physician members in the legislature, four uh, in the Senate, uh, three in the majority party and one in the minority party, and uh, one physician in the House. Uh, so it's, it's aptly named the Physician Caucus. 
Uh, it has some uh, de facto members like uh, Chairman Cooper, whose late husband was a physician. Um, and it's a, it's a robust group that uh, Devin and I and Kathleen work very closely with in uh, virtually every piece of legislation. So uh, for the first time in many years, uh, and some of you probably remember some of the bad years like 2017, uh, very different feel uh, this year at the, at the legislature. One of the um, additional firewalls, uh, so to speak, in the Senate, uh, not only is Senator Ben Watson, a physician from Savannah, um, chairman of the Senate Health Committee, very important post, and uh, all physicians in the Senate serve on that committee with him, uh, with uh, about eight or so other folks. Uh, but for the first time uh, ever, we have a physician chairing the Senate Insurance Committee, Dean Burke uh, from Bainbridge. Um, a novel idea to have physicians at the helm in those two important roles, so we're very pleased uh, to work side by side with them. And this year, uh, we really saw a streamlined approach for uh, what I'm going to dove with a lot of bias is common sense public policy. House on the other side, uh, we have uh, Mark Newton, physician who chairs the uh, special committee on uh, access to quality health care. It, uh, it is not a standing committee, meaning it is not a, uh, a certain committee at all times like rules or uh, health and human services, but uh, it's been in place for the last couple of years uh, and uh, has, has carried a good amount of uh, what I would dub as reform measures like PBM reform, um, got into to some of the other sort of pricing uh, legislation. So we, we work closely with Dr. Newton. And then of course, as always, the Senate, I'm sorry, House Health and Human Services Committee with Representative Sharon Cooper, uh, the longtime chair and longtime champion. A lot of, lot of new folks, uh, and, uh, and since the session has concluded uh, in the last two weeks, a lot of moving parts, uh, throwing, throwing uh, names into races for uh, the next election. So we, at, uh, at the onset now, know of about eight sitting members of the General Assembly that are going to run for higher office, so that'll beget uh, a lot more change. Um, one of the, uh, there, there were a number of uh, uh, pieces of legislation uh, that we did not, uh, did not work on and did not uh, closely follow other than the press accounts like the election, uh, the, the much uh, attention has been given to the election overhaul legislation. Uh, it is law. Uh, it was signed in, as some of you may have caught uh, in press accounts, signed into uh, law the night uh, the legislature passed it uh, several weeks ago. Uh, but uh, largely uh, the, the, the marquee legislation, certainly, again, biased in thinking, but the, uh, the primary focus, uh, that, uh, and obviously ours, was on, on health care. Uh, I'm going to throw it to, uh, to Devin to start sort of marching through uh, the bills that passed, and we have a uh, Hopefully everybody can see on the, the screen, so I'm going to walk through that. Uh, and certainly, I guess, Robin, how are we doing questions? Are we just taking those or are those going in the chat? Um, we can take questions. Um, it is very helpful to have them in the chat as well. Um, but we're happy uh, for you to take yourselves off mute, uh, just not all at once. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Devin? Thanks. Very good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, 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 good to see you all. Just want to, uh, to, to run through <clears throat> some of the things that Travis had mentioned uh, earlier on with, uh, with some of the key pieces of legislation uh, that did make their way through, and then uh, also some of the legislation that will uh, continue to the 2022 legislative session. Uh, so in case you all forgot, that's our, uh, the, the lovely uh, gold dome there. Uh, just uh, put that in there for fun, but um, I, I'm going to let uh, Kathleen uh, here in a little bit uh, hit uh, on some more details for the budget, but uh, I guess want to mention what's next, and Travis hit on this. Uh, as a reminder, all uh, new laws take effect uh, on July 1 unless another date uh, is specified in the bill. Uh, Travis mentioned the 40-day the uh, veto uh, or signing. Uh, before uh, they automatically go into uh, to law if they are not signed after the 40-day 
uh, 40-day term. So uh, we'll go through a couple bills here on the next uh, next slide. I'm going to go back to that for Kathleen. So uh, these are some of the hot topic uh, pieces of legislation that uh, we, we did work on some of these and, and not on others. Uh, the Senate Bill 100, which is uh, the Daylight Savings Time Bill, uh, that did pass into law. Uh, it was uh, a heavily debated bill that uh, states that Georgia would uh, observe daylight savings time year round. Uh, of course, if Congress authorizes it, um, it was passed uh, by both chambers overwhelmingly. Uh, just want to note, uh, certainly don't uh, don't be changing your clocks. Uh, federal law uh, currently prohibits the states uh, from making those uh, those times permanent until they pass something. So uh, just wanted to note that uh, sports betting, uh, Senate Bill 142. On House Bill 86, uh, that did uh, did pass. There was some last minute uh, discussion uh, that there could be a, a deal struck, um, but uh, it, it ended up failing and uh, will end up being pushed to 2022. Uh, gun reciprocity, uh, as you may imagine, with uh, all of the, the violence that has ensued this past year uh, so far and even uh, back to, to 2019 and 2020, uh, that bill did, uh, did fail as well. Uh, House Bill 290, uh, which I'm sure most of you have, have heard of was the, the Right to Visit Act by Representative Ed Setzler. Uh, that bill went through multiple hearings uh, in, in committee and then uh, was heavily debated on the uh, both the House uh, and, and Senate floor uh, for discussion and ended up, uh, again, in the, the final hours of uh, tiny die failing. Uh, I do believe that there will be some semblance of that bill that will uh, will come up in the 2022 session. So. Uh, keep uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, last, the House Bill 605, which is the, the granny cameras bill, uh, that also failed in the, the final hours of the evening. Uh, essentially, that legislation was looking to uh, seek permission to allow uh, cameras in long-term care facilities so that families could have uh, the some peace of mind regarding their loved ones uh, and their care. All right, uh, so these are the, the some of the legislation that uh, that we worked on as uh, the government affairs team. Uh, Senate Bill 5 uh, by Dr. K. Kirkpatrick, as Travis mentioned, one of the physicians in the Senate. Uh, this just looks to update uh, code section pertaining to sedation in non-hospital settings. Uh, this is, has been around for quite some time uh, as, as far as the legislation goes, so nothing controversial, uh, but uh, it, that that update is is in the final update that we sent. Uh, if you care to dig into uh, to that any any more, Senate Bill 46 is the big uh, public health cleanup bill uh, by the Department of Public Health, uh, authorizing certain medical personnel to administer vaccines uh, during public health emergencies. Uh, this this bill ended up lasting uh, until the final day uh, of session. Uh, there's additional language in there pertaining to mass vaccination sites uh, and waiving the requirement uh, of checking the state's grit system during a public health emergency. Uh, I'll add on as well, there, the, there's games that are played, uh, certainly in the last uh, final days of session. Uh, there were two additional bills that actually got tacked on to, uh, to the Department uh, of Public Health cleanup bill, uh, and we'll hit on those here in just, uh, just a few minutes. Uh, Senate Bill 80 by Dr. Kirkpatrick. Again, uh, this is the prior authorization legislation, uh, something that's been in the works for many, many years. Uh, still not uh, not perfected, uh, and we'll we'll take some uh, some, some a further look into the 2022 legislative session. Uh, Senate Bill 195 is the uh, originally it was the hemp farming update. Uh, now this includes um, House Bill 645, which is uh, the cannabis uh, cannabis commission, the cleanup legislation for uh, for that, uh, just uh, update some language pertaining to the code sections to to keep in line with some of the uh, state and federal regulations. Uh, again, all, all these bills uh, that I'm going through can be found in the the update uh, that uh, that went out to y'all, uh, but certainly can answer any questions. Senate Bill 235, uh, Dr. Watson, uh, Ben Watson, uh, this seeks to exempt mask wearing uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, this is, is simply removing uh, state criminal anti-mask laws uh, for one year from the end of the public health emergency in the state of Georgia uh, ending. So uh, it, it is current law that uh, mask wearing can be a criminal uh, offense 
uh, and they have added that uh, from one year from the end of the public health emergency, uh, there will no, no longer be criminal uh, offenses for that. A couple of uh, House bills here, uh, legislation ex uh, to expected to be signed into law. House Bill 112 uh, is the COVID-19 uh, immunity legislation. Uh, this is simply just uh, taking the, the current immunity legislation that was passed in the 2020 session, uh, which was Senate Bill 359. Uh, this is the big signs that I'm sure most of you have on, on practices, uh, but that you see going into uh, grocery stores, restaurants, uh, all uh, basically in, immunizing the, the folks uh, that are walking into those uh, those buildings. So that goes out for another year. Uh, House Bill 163 by uh, Chairman Cooper uh, just directs the uh, Georgia's Medicaid program to uh, adopt an, a quote unquote express lane uh, eligibility for kids who qualify for Medicaid coverage. Um, so we'll, we expect that to be signed into law. House Bill 234. Uh, by Representative Hawkins. Uh, this is an extension of the surprise billing legislation, uh, House Bill 888, uh, that passed uh, last year in the 2020 session. Uh, this legislation, however, seeks to provide an option for uh, self-funded health care plans to exempt uh, from the state regulation under the federal law uh, and to opt into Georgia Surprise Billing Consumer Protection Act, which again, that is the law that was signed into uh, signed into law last year, uh, House Bill 888. Uh, House Bill 307, I would say, is a, a, a key piece and a trademark piece of legislation, certainly for the state of Georgia. Uh, this seeks to amend the, the Georgia Telehealth Act. Uh, this Georgia is actually the first uh, in the nation to, uh, to pass this legislation and likely to be signed into law. Uh, we had a, a conversation with the governor's office yesterday that uh, provided that, that that will continue and be signed into law here shortly. This uh, codifies the, uh, the the current law pertaining to telehealth to keep in line with uh, the way that, uh, that we've been pr uh, practicing telehealth throughout the uh, public health emergency. Uh, so again, anticipate that being signed into law here shortly. Uh, House Bill 454 by uh, Representative Mark Newton, a uh, physician out of Augusta. Uh, this is uh, seeking to provide uh, coverage requirements concerning providers that become out of network uh, during a plan year. So this is also known uh, as the continuity of care legislation. Uh, so when insurers uh, provider directory uh, includes a provider as a participating provider for a network plan uh, and a, an individual selects that plan, they should be able to continue uh, to, to pay those uh, in-network rates uh, for the, the length of the plan. So uh, there's been, been certainly some uh, concerns throughout the years of uh, patients uh, opting into a plan and then uh, seemingly uh, going out of network, uh, certainly on the, the insurance side, and then them uh, receiving a, uh, an out of network or a surprise bill. So uh, this would just ensure that that continues to, uh, to, to stay as is. Uh, just a few more here. Senate, uh, or this is a legislation, I'm sorry, that'll be held for 2022. Uh, Senate Bill 19, which is uh, surgical smoke. I know we've had uh, many discussions on that. Uh, Senate Bill 82, uh, this is a prudent layperson legislation. Uh, this also is, is somewhat of a, an addition to uh, House Bill 888, uh, which is the surprise billing legislation that I mentioned. Uh, this proposes a, a measure to require insurers to pay for uh, emergency services regardless uh, of the interim uh, or final diagnosis of the patient. So this is, if y'all will remember, uh, there's certainly been some issues in the past with uh, with our friends at Blue Cross, as well as some of the others, uh, not paying for, for emergency visits. So this would uh, would help to, to fix that. Um, Senate Bill 164 uh, by uh, Senator Huffstetler, that's a modernization of Georgia's HIV laws uh, to align services and policies with uh, the best public health practices. It brings brings everything up to code with uh, some of the other states in the nation, and Kathleen can hit on that uh, after she hits on the budget. Um, House Bill 447 by Representative Knight, that is simply just a, a pharmacy benefit manager uh, update. Uh, for those of you that know Representative Knight, he's passionate about uh, PBMs uh, and, and uh, the work that uh, they do or don't do. Uh, but uh, he'll he'll be working on that. 
House Bill 627 by Representative LaHood uh, seeking to, to update and require athletic trainers, uh, training students to be under direct supervision of a physician. Uh, and then House Bill 823 by uh, Representative Newton. Uh, this seeks to require health insurers to pass along uh, no later, uh, less than 80% of all prescription drug rebates uh, to the customer at the pharmacy counter. Uh, so that, that is the, uh, the quick and dirty breakdown. Again, uh, you all have an update uh, that, that has been sent to you that, that gives the, the full details of the legislation. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, on it or can pass it over to Kathleen for a quick budget update. Hey, Devin, this is Mike. The the last one, HB 823, does that? Yes. How, how, do, how does that, does that cover our RISA plans or is that just fully insured plans? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question, Mike. That would, uh, would not cover uh, ERISA plans. Uh, it also does not include state health benefit plans, so just uh, just private insured. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, any any other questions? I know that was a, a lot in a short uh, short time frame, and I'm happy to uh, to answer any. All right, Kathleen, you want to give a quick uh, budget update, please? Uh, yes, there were um, a couple of uh, good um, additions to the DBHDD's 21, um, a 22 budget. Um, on adult addictive disease services, there was an increase of core services of around uh, $2.7 mil million. And in the adult mental health uh, service section, there was an increase of about uh, 6.5 uh, million to uh, core services. And um, underneath the adult developmental disability services, um, there is um, an increased funds for a 5% rate increase for um, IDD providers if there is approval from CMS on this. And that was um, around $12.3 mil million. And those are some of the highlights of, of the budget. Thanks, Kathleen. Right. Go ahead, Devin. No, that, that was it. I'm just going to offer up uh, any, any additional questions. Uh, certainly don't hesitate to let us know. I know the, the team at SHP has sent, sent the update out and has our contact information uh, well, uh, well peppered throughout there. Uh, so it's got our cell phones and emails. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, at any time. To, Devin, Travis, I don't know if y'all are planning to cover this now, but the, the the DOI update material that you guys had sent out to us recently, can you briefly cover that with the group and kind of give them an update on what's going on from their perspective, pretty please? Yes, sir. Um, and thanks, Mike, for the question. Uh, so we, Travis and, and myself, uh, as well as some of the team from the, the Medical Association of Georgia met with uh, Greg Conley, who's the executive counsel to uh, Commissioner King, uh, met with him on Monday morning just to, to get a, a post-session update uh, on a multitude of things, but some of the, the key points and, and things that we hit on. Uh, first and foremost is, is probably the, the market conduct review uh, that is currently underway. Uh, on uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Georgia, uh, that is is essentially a full uh, audit of uh, of Blue Cross and all of their workings, internal and external. Uh, this is a, a hard look at their their email exchanges, communication between uh, uh, patients, communication between uh, practices, physicians, uh, everything from from A to Z. So uh, anticipate that in the next. 30 to, to 60 days, there'll be an initial uh, document that will, will be rendered uh, by the, the group that's auditing them uh, to the Department of Insurance for, for DOI to then assess uh, how they're going to proceed, whether it be uh, via fines, um, certainly anything that, that does come out um, will, will be public as far as uh, fines go. Uh, the report itself uh, will not, as that does contain some some confidential information. Um, on top of that, not just the market conduct review. There's a a, a hard look uh, across all payers, uh, United, Humana, uh, all of them, uh, in some of their uh, 
their their poor communication uh, that they've had. And, and I know uh, many of you on this phone have, have reached out to, uh, to us, uh, have joined on some of the third party payer calls by the Medical Association to express your frustration. Uh, and we've got that message loud and clear uh, over to DOI. And I think they're they're starting to enforce some of those things. One, one uh, tidbit that was told to us is the uh, the, the updates pertaining to if, if you, you have to go on and find your physician, uh, are they they actually listed uh, in network or out of network? So uh, those were, were found not to be updated, the provider directories uh, on, on multiple cases, and, and they were fined for those. Uh, so that's that's a start. Um, the, the last big piece that we hit on was the, the surprise billing implementation, which uh, I spoke of earlier, uh, House Bill 888 from last year. DOI uh, has authority uh, to, to implement and promulgate rules and regulations uh, surrounding uh, that piece of legislation. Uh, they are in the final stages uh, of implementing that. They have until July 1, uh, according to their rules and regulations, to finalize uh, the arbitration piece uh, that is, is heavily weighted throughout the bill. Um, anticipate if if you if you have issues and you have had issues since January one, which is a, effectively when the law went into effect. If you are having issues, uh, make sure that you're sending those to uh, the Georgia Department of Insurance uh, to their their emails, and we can provide that. Uh, but do want to note. There will be a portal uh, here in the near future that will be uh, be placed on the Department of Insurance website for any uh, of those surprise billing issues uh, for, for folks to be able to enter those. And DOI will be sending out an email uh, to all uh, providers uh, and all practices explaining how that, uh, that portal and that system is actually going to work and how you need to input the information. So. Uh, keep an eye out for that here in the next couple months as this all gets finalized. But again, uh, if you, you've had issues uh, since January 1, uh, we'll, we'll share the email with uh, the, the folk, Mike and, and John and Robin, that can, can send out uh, to y'all to, to go ahead and send those initial claims in uh, just to have it on the books. Uh, Mike or Travis, I'm sorry, anything uh, missed on that? Uh, I think you covered it. Devin, I, I guess the follow-up to that would be that for the bulk of the people on this call, the the typical issue they've had with the carriers has tended to be around either systemic underpayments, as in, you know, just wrong fee schedule and, you know, 12 months later, unable to get it fixed. Uh, unilateral adjustments to agreements that are kind of one-sided fee schedule adjustments, either on the commercial or the Medicare Advantage side. So I guess split the answer between that two. And then the kind of the policy changes that come down the pike that are that are fee schedule that are remittent the reimbursement changes covered in a policy change where it's a mid-level you know a forced mid-level um, uh, no incident two rule kind of united type issue. Um, any advice for the group here about what to do with those kind of issues or filling up the queue at DOI about that? getting to somebody on the Medicare Advantage side and the on the CMS side to deal with those thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the the Medicare Advantage side, um, that's, you know, certainly is separate from from the Georgia Department of Insurance. I, I think anything anything pertaining to the, the state side of things uh, outside of Medicare Advantage <laughs> issues that are being had, uh, Mike, all the ones that you just ran through, uh, we, we had discussed uh, extensively in that meeting, uh, and the answer was certainly, you know, keep continue to keep the, the issues coming. Uh, I, I would note that the Medical Association uh, of Georgia has set up a specific email uh, for these very issues, uh, and they're compiling those to, to send over to DOI. They, I believe they send them over on a weekly basis uh, to DOI to make sure that they're they're keeping up with those, so uh, you can certainly share them. Share them with us. Uh, share them with uh, with the medical association. Their third party payer email. Um, that's just it's tpp at mag org. Again, we can share that email. Um, but yeah, continue to to get those sent over. 
because as I mentioned, they are, while the market conduct review is, is simply a, a look at Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, the, there is a, a very heavy look across all of the payers uh, and their behaviors, whether it's with the, the contracting side, uh, the uh, not uploading uh, of, of codes, um, we've, we've kind of covered it all. Uh, so keep, keep those coming. Um, is that offer valid or available to the practices on this call that are not uh, MAG members, Devin? Would they accept those? They want all comers? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. that's helpful. We will distribute. Thank you for that. You bet. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kathleen. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Um, y'all feel free to stay on or drop off, Devin Travis. It's uh, I know y'all are real busy. Um, all right. We're gonna in our remaining time here. Let's shift gears and give you a little bit of a COVID update from the new stuff that's come out. And I keep having this discussion with Kelly that every time we put this together, we don't think that much has moved. It turns out a little bit more has kind of come through than I've been expecting. And so when we kind of mush it all back together, there's there's enough to talk about. Um, slip to that next slide there, Aaron. All right, so the American Rescue Plan went through and one of the things, there's, there's two, three things about that to talk about. Um, one of them is that we told y'all before that the, it opened back up registration for the health exchange. And as you see below, it it, it, it opened from 215 to 515. Um, more than 40,000 Jordans, Jordans have gotten in. So kind of put in perspective that there was about 500,000, maybe a shade over that were in statewide before. And then, so they've added about another 8% to it. If you're one of the hospitals who are on the phone today, um, Remember, this is an opportunity to take your self-pay emergency room folks and shepherd them toward the some kind of coverage that's out there. And whether or not we like it, high deductible coverage one way or the other, at least it beats um, them showing up as self-pay in the emergency room. And so we typically are kind of encouraging you guys to get involved in pushing that along. And you see that Georgia has been one of the higher states that in getting new enrollees out of it. Now, typically, the bulk of the enrollments come at the end of the process. So I would expect that $40,000 number to go up fairly drastically before all is said and done. Next slide. Um, the COBRA subsidies, I don't know if you heard about this, but one of the other things that came through in that same law is that there's a new 100% subsidization of COBRA premiums for laid off workers. And so they were laid off during the past period. Uh, I'll show you more in just a second about who's eligible, who's not. But basically what it's saying is that the premium coverage for people own COBRA, COBRA who are not voluntarily there, but were involuntarily terminated um, is going to be 100% paid through September 30th. I'll talk about in just a second about where that comes from. Um, but it's for the AEIs or an assistance eligible individual. Next slide. And we'll talk about who those are. Um, a lot of detail here, but the upshot is that if you if somebody left your organization involuntarily and they would they they obviously would qualify for COBRA if it was involuntary, they qualify for the subsidization. If somebody left voluntarily, that next bullet there, they're not eligible for it. But a couple of caveats to that is that the rule kind of goes backwards in that if you if COBRA hit if COBRA hit if COVID hit and you had um, folks that you had to let go even back to, you know, still within the covert, the 18 month COVID coverage period, but um, they haven't elected coverage or they started to elect it or they elected it for a while and they have subsequently dropped it. If they're still within the 18 month period, they can pick it back up and still have it 100% subsidized at this point. And so that's what those two kind of sub bullets are under the third one there. And then the last one is that this stops when either you're eligible for Medicare, or you get another full-time job. And so um, just remember that you have to offer this and which moves us to the next slide. Um, the, the way it happens is that you have to front the cost of it by paying for it and you're not charging the, your, person for it, your 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 ex-employee for it, 
and you claim that as a refundable credit against your payroll taxes. And so on the quarterly tax filing, there will be a process for you to be credited back uh, against your payroll tax submission, the amount of money that, that would have been involved in that. And so at the end of the day, it's it's you front it, but you get it back later on. And you see some, we'll post this to the website, you see the other links to get some more information going on that. Um, next slide. So the provider relief fund, the reporting for it that we've all been waiting on, where's this going from here? And I've told many of you guys individually that we think part of the reason that it's on hold is what happens in the next one or two rounds of, of uh, stimulus packages that go out there, whether or not there's anything else that will address who has to report or there are some limits of under which um, less reporting or no real reporting is going to be required. Don't know that yet. But at this point, what we do know is that nothing's happened basically since January the 15th. The portal went live for registration only, and they haven't, the, the FAQ stopped, and the, um, the portal is out there for registration. The reason why it's so important to do that, to go ahead and, and register, is two things. One is that is your intent to file a, uh, a justification for the funds that you received in order for you to retain the funds you received under the current ruling of it right now. And then any any updates to that are going to come for two back to people who have registered. And so uh, as we've been saying over and over again, if you want any more detail to it, we can walk you through it. But it, it takes about 20 minutes to do it. You got to do it in one session, but we highly recommend that you take the 20 minutes to do it. Um, at some point, they're going to shut that off. And if you haven't, we're fearful. If you haven't done it, we're fearful that that's going to mess you up from trying to send in your justification when the portal opens in earnest later on. Next slide. Um, we have talked to several of you about the fact that, it, and also in that American Rescue Plan, there was a, a an additional provider relief fund out there that is earmarked toward rural providers. And it's 8.5 billion that's in the law. However, couple that with the remaining unspent provider relief funds from prior rounds, and there's a shade over 30 billion in the mix. So it's for rural providers, and if you're in Savannah, you would think, okay, I'm probably not a rural provider uh, or in any of the other areas, but the HHS secretary has some really broad powers, and I went through them in detail last time. Um, but one of the classifications that they can use, that they likely will use, is a county that has less than 500,000 people in it. So as I've been saying, we all in the sticks, and so it's likely we're all rural providers outside of Atlanta. And so um, we need to be prepared to do this. There is an, they have said that there's going to be an application process, but they haven't, they haven't published what that looks like, what the, what the, um, the distribution methodology or the qualification methodology will be underneath it. So um, we will, we continue to monitor the websites for that. As soon as anything comes out, we'll let you know. Um, but y'all need to be staying on top of it as well. Next slide. Um, PPP provisions, as we've been sort of trumpeting, uh, the as you probably saw, the, it got extended from 331 to 531 for first and second draw loans. And it's, so it's it, it appears to us that it's well funded at this point. It doesn't seem like there's a run on the banks. Our our feedback has been that it's not nearly the activity that it was last time. But nonetheless, it is open. And for all of you who haven't who qualified for round one and haven't done the the quarter over quarter calculation to see if you qualify for this time the 25 percent reduction in revenue on a similar quarter of last year um, that we highly recommend that you do that and then follow through with the application if you qualify but another point that i don't think we've been hitting home hard enough if you're one of the larger empl uh, employers out there really our larger hospitals um, previously, if you had more than 500 employees, you simply didn't qualify back during round one rules. Now it is a, it's the rule is 500 employees per physical location. And so um, what that basically means is that if you're a hospital that has a thousand employees and you have physician practices and imaging centers and things like that, where you have people working full time in a in a USPS postal address that's different from the main uh, location of the hospital, those locations qualify, even if, it, if it's still under a single tax ID number or under an affiliate 10, 
still qualifies at this point. And so, um, you know, some of you guys that, that didn't qualify last time, between your outlying locations, position practices, or what have you, um, a chunk of your payroll will qualify. And because you did not participate in round one, you're under first draw rules, not second draw rules. And so you have a $10 million limit, not a $2 million limit for the forgivable loans this time. Kelly, anything to add to that? No, I think that's got it, Mike. Okay. Um, the, one other point, go down to the next slide, Aaron. One other point around all this that we wanted to make was that in the SBA regulations, um, the, a borrower is supposed to apply for loan forgiveness within 10 months of the last day of the covered period. So, you know, I got the money on X day, then I had eight weeks at the time or, or later on, you know, 24 weeks if you select that. But 10 months after that, I'm supposed to apply. And so for some of you guys, that timing is kind of coming around. Uh, if you got the money back in April and you did choose an eight week period, you're kind of at the 10 month or, or yeah, 10 month period now from then. It doesn't seem like the banks have been pushing people for uh, being very stringent about that. But nonetheless, um, in theory, by what the, the SBA laws or, or the rules promulgated, uh, it was that after the 10 month period, you're supposed to begin making loan payments. And so it's at that point, you know, it's, it becomes a real loan. And so we would recommend that you either get your application in or from round one, or that you are certainly understanding from your bank what, what they're going to enforce at this point. Uh, now, that said, even if you get in that mode, um, one thing we probably haven't been talking about enough as well is that even if you've clipped the 10 months and you're in payback mode, that doesn't mean you've lost the ability to apply for forgiveness. Um, you still have that uh, up until the maturity date of the loan. And so you can do that. It's just not 100% clear about whether or not the payments you make in between are also forgiven or whether or not it's just the future payments that are out there. And so, um, you know, still highly recommend that you guys either go ahead and turn in forgiveness or make sure that you understand what the deal is with what your bank's deal is around that. Uh, next slide. And the uh, last one we have here from Medicare, Medicare sequestration perspective, um, in theory, it's back on as a 4-1, but Congress is in the process of dealing with that and is expected to pass legislation to continue to put the uh, hold on it and push it all the way through 12-31. That said, um, CMS has announced that because of that and because they're up in the air about where the sequestration applies or does not apply for this period, that uh, they've put a hold on Medicare claims that are dated, that are dates of service in uh, post 330. And so granted, this ought to be worked out uh, by the time that all comes around, but nonetheless, you're, you, you may get caught in a little bit of a time gap there of where they're not gonna, you know, where you're gonna, they're gonna hold some claims until that legislation works its way through the process. Um, as it says there, we'll provide any updates that we have. Fully expect this to get resolved in the next couple of weeks, and it shouldn't be on hold terribly long. But I know everybody's cash flow is tight, and so um, we'll we'll continue to monitor it and let you guys know what the deal is. And with that, next slide. Uh, anybody have any questions? Or Kelly, you have any other comments? Anything I missed? I don't mind. Okay. All right. Anybody else got any questions? Well, if you don't, holler, be sure to holler at us if you do have, think of anything later on. Uh, certainly glad to get on the phone and chat through anything that we've talked through today. Aaron? All righty. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. In particular, thanks to the Capital Strategy Group for uh, giving us that legislative update. It, it sure is great. Uh, just a reminder, this will be posted to our website at shpllc.com slash webinars later this afternoon. You'll be able to download a copy of the slides as well as uh, the recording for today. And with that, uh, we will give you 13 minutes back to your day. Everyone have a lovely week. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe right. and well.